Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about pulmonary edema. And before we look at some radiographs, I just want to show you schematically what we're going to be talking about. So this isn't exactly anatomically correct, but for the purposes of this talk, it's going to be very useful. So what we have here is a cluster of alveoli, and at the periphery of this cluster of alve alveoli, we have a pulmonary capillary or venule. Okay, and in between the two is the pulmonary interstitium. So let's think for a second about a patient with left ventricular heart failure. So a patient with LV failure has increased pressure in the left ventricle that gets transmitted to the left atrium and that gets transmitted to the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins will respond initially by dilating. And this is not yet pulmonary edema. This is a redistribution of blood in the lungs. And usually what happens is in a normal person, the veins in the lower lungs are larger than the veins in the upper lungs. Well, in a patient in the early stages before pulmonary edema, there's a cephalization of the blood flow in which the veins in the upper lungs will dilate and they'll be about equal or even greater in size to the veins in the lower lungs. And in this stage, this is called pulmonary vascular congestion or cephalization of the pulmonary vasculature, but it's not yet overt edema because the fluid is still in the pulmonary vessels. So as that pressure continues to increase, however, then fluid will start to leach out from the vessels into the interstitial space. Okay, and that I'm going to demonstrate by this blue line in the interstitium. So this is called interstitial pulmonary edema, and this is actual pulmonary edema because fluid has now left the pulmonary veins and capillaries. As that fluid continues to build up, it spills out of the interstitial space and goes into the alveolar space. And this is the final stage of pulmonary edema, and it's called alveolar pulmonary edema or airspace edema. When you have an actual patient with pulmonary edema, you're going to see a little bit of pulmonary edema that's airspace and some pulmonary edema that's interstitial. The appearance is usually very heterogeneous. So what I've tried to do with this is give you an overview of the pathophysiology of pulmonary edema. So just as a review, we start out with increased hydrostatic pressure, which causes pulmonary vascular congestion and cephalization of the pulmonary vessels. And then fluid leaves the pulmonary vessels and goes into the interstitial space, where we then have interstitial pulmonary edema. And then fluid then spills into the alveolar space, in which point we get alveolar pulmonary edema. All right, so let's look at some real-life examples of pulmonary edema on radiograph. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. This is a patient with CHF. You can see that their heart is slightly enlarged. And when I zoom in on the vessels, when I'm trying to figure out if they have pulmonary edema or not, I take the vessels in the upper lung and I compare those vessels to an equidistant point in the lower lung, equidistant from the hyla. And you can see that these vessels in the lower lung, this one is behind the diaphragm here, are slightly larger than the vessels up here in the upper lung, which seem to be a little bit smaller and thinner. Okay, and this is a patient who has no pulmonary edema. Okay, so let's take a look at this same patient a couple days later when they developed pulmonary edema. So at this time, what you'll notice about the vessels is that these vessels in the upper lung are now equal in size to the vessels in the lower lung. And the other thing is they appear to be crowded as well. Right? And that is because not only are the vessels more enlarged, but they are not as well defined as they were on the prior study. Okay, so let me just zoom this in here and we'll compare the exact spot. So notice how you could see and define the borders of these vessels very well when they have normal lungs, but now the borders of these vessels becomes very fuzzy, right? And the other findings that you'll see here are that you'll see vessels all the way out in the lung periphery. And these are curly B lines or interlobular septal thickening. Okay, so 
this is a patient who has interstitial pulmonary edema. But remember that I told you that most patients with pulmonary edema will have some interstitial and some alveolar edema. Well, in this patient, there's also alveolar edema as well. So all of this stuff down here, this stuff down here, represents alveolar edema. Okay, so in this patient, we have interstitial pulmonary edema with these curly B lines and this indistinct pulmonary vasculature, and we have alveolar edema. Okay, how about a more subtle case? So here I have the same patient again as in the earlier example, and I just want to zoom in into the right upper lobe. And what I want you to notice is that in the right upper lobe here, we have those same three vessels, one, two, three, but in this example, those vessels are dilated. But as opposed to the other example, you could still see the borders of these vessels very well. So I would say that in this example, we don't have overt pulmonary edema, but instead we have cephalization of the pulmonary vasculature or pulmonary vascular congestion without overt edema. In other words, the vessels or the blood has redistributed to the upper lungs, but the edema fluid has not leached out of the blood vessels into the interstitial space. Another point that I'd like to make here is that some radiologists use different terms for pulmonary edema. So I am using the term pulmonary vascular congestion to mean a redistribution of blood in the lungs but without actual edema. Some radiologists use the term pulmonary vascular congestion to mean pulmonary edema. Okay, so it's important at wherever institution you're working at to understand the vocabulary that people are using so that everybody can be on the same page. So let's take a look at another example. So in this case I'm looking at the vessels and trying to determine if there's pulmonary edema. And I think in this example that the vessels are sharp, the borders of the vessels are very well demarcated, and the vessels in the upper lungs are smaller than the vessels in the lower lungs. So in this case I would say that there's no pulmonary edema. This is normal. Well, a day later, you could see that there's been a big change. First of all, the vessels in the upper lungs are a lot more indistinct. That means that the edema fluid has moved from the vessel, the vessel to the interstitial space. And then another even better sign here is that we have interlobular septal thickening, and that is manifest by these curly B lines, which are short one centimeter lines in the lung periphery and this represents fluid in the interstitial space. So this is a patient with interstitial pulmonary edema. If we go further, even one day further, we could see that there has been an increase in the amount of pulmonary edema. And rather than seeing just lines, what we have here are fluffy airspace opacities in both lungs. So in this case, we have alveolar edema. But remember that in most cases where you have alveolar edema, you will still have interstitial edema. And if we zoom into the right lower lung, we have curly B lines here. So we have alveolar edema and interstitial edema both. Okay, let's take a look at another example. So this is our baseline study here. And you can see at this point that the patient has a Swan-Ganz catheter. They also have a big heart and they have an AICD in place. So already I'm thinking that I should be on high alert for pulmonary edema. So when I'm trying to decide whether they have pulmonary edema, let's zoom this up and let's look at the vessels. So the vessels here in the upper lungs I would say are very sharp and they're normal in size. The vessels in the upper lungs are smaller than the vessels in the lower lungs. So let's look at a follow-up study a couple days later. Now the first thing you'll notice when you look at this follow-up chest x-ray is that the vessels in the upper lungs and the lower lungs for that matter have dilated in comparison to the baseline study. So that tells us that there has been redistribution of pulmonary blood and this is pulmonary vascular congestion. Now the next question of course is, is this simply pulmonary vascular congestion or is there also interstitial pulmonary edema?
And what I would say is that these vessels, while they are dilated, they still remain sharp. I could still see the borders of them very clearly. Therefore, the fluid remains in the pulmonary vessels and has not yet leached out into the interstitium. So I would call this pulmonary vascular congestion without overt edema. So that was the last example. And I hope you all learned something today about the radiographic appearance of pulmonary edema. If you have any questions about this video or other concepts that we've discussed, feel free to leave a comment below or uh, you can direct message me. My contact information is on the about page of this channel.